But let's just talk about the humoral, the humoral response right now that deals with B lymphocytes. So B lymphocytes, or B cells, let me, let me do them in blue, B for blue. So let's say that that is a B lymphocyte. It's a white blood cell. It's a subset of white blood cells called lymphocytes. It comes from the bone marrow. And that's where the, well, the B comes from Bershaw's for Bershaw's, but we don't want to go into detail there. But they have all of these proteins on their surface, actually close to 10,000 of them. It's actually, well, I get very excited about B cells, and I'll tell you why in a second. So it has all of these proteins on them that look something like this. I'll just draw a couple of them. These proteins, these, these, actually, these are actually protein complexes. You can kind of view them. They actually have four separate proteins on them. And we, we can call these proteins membrane-bound membrane -bound antibodies. So these right here are membrane membrane-bound antibodies. And, I, and I'll talk a lot more about antibodies. You've probably heard the word, you know, do you have antibodies for such and such flu or such and such virus? And we're going to talk more about that in the future. But you can really just, antibodies are just proteins. And sometimes they'll, you know, they'll, they're often referred to as immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins. Teaching biology really stresses my, the spelling part of my brain. But these are essentially equivalent equivalent words. Antibodies are immunoglobulins, and they're really just proteins. Now, B cells have these on the surface on the surface of their membranes. These are membrane bound. Usually when people talk about antibodies, they're talking about free antibodies that are going to be that are going to just be floating floating around like that. And I'm going to go I'm going to go into more detail on how those are produced. Now, what's really 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 interesting about these membrane-bound antibodies and these B cells in particular is that a B cell has one type of membrane-bound antibody on it. Each B cell, right? Each B so you know, that's one B cell and let me draw another B cell here. So let's say that this is another B cell right here. It's going to also have antibodies but those antibodies are going to be different. So and we'll focus on where they're different. So let me just draw them the same color first, and then we'll focus on where they're different. So that's one antibody membrane bound. That's another antibody membrane bound. These are both B cells. They both have these antibodies on them. Now the interesting thing is, is that from one B cell to another B cell, they have a variable part, on, variable part on this antibody that can take a bunch of different that can take on a bunch of different forms. So this one might look like that, and that, and these are the so these long. I'll, I'll go into more detail on that and like that, and that. So the colors. Well, I don't, let me do it like. Actually, let me do it. The, so there's the fixed portion you can find is green for any kind of antibody, and then there's a variable portion. So maybe this guy's variable portion is. I'll do it in pink. And every one of the antibodies bond to his membrane are going to have that same variable portion. No, but this different B cell is going to have different variable portions. So I'll do that in a, let me do it in a different color. I mean, I'll do it in magenta. So his variable portions are going to be different. Are going to be different, just like that. Now, he has 10,000 of these on his surface, and every one of these have the same variable portions, but they're all different from the variable portions on this B cell. And there's actually there's actually 10 billion different combinations of variable portions. So there's 10 to the 10th or 10 billion combinations combinations of variable portions. So the first question, and I haven't even told you what the variable portions are good for, is how do that many different combinations arise? Obviously, these proteins, or maybe not so obviously, all these proteins that are part of most cells are produced by the, ge the genes of that cell. So if I draw, you know, this is the nucleus. It's got, it's got DNA inside the nucleus. This guy has a nucleus. It's got DNA inside the nucleus. If these guys are both B cells, and they're both coming from the same germ line, they're coming from the same, uh, 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 I guess, uh, ancestry of cells, shouldn't they have the same DNA? Shouldn't they have the same DNA? 
And if they do have the same DNA, and I'll put a big question mark there, if they do have the same DNA, why are the proteins that they're constructing different? How do they change? And this is what, why I find B cells, and you'll see this is also true of T cells, to be fascinating is in their development, in, in their hematopoiesis, I always have trouble of, uh, of pronouncing that word, but that's just the development of these lymphocytes. At one stage in their development, there's just a lot of shuffling of the portion of their DNA that codes for here, for these parts of the protein. There's just a lot of shuffling that occurs. So in mo you know, most of when we talk about DNA, we really want to preserve the information, not have a lot of shuffling. But when these lymphocytes, when these B cells are, are maturing, at one stage of their maturation or, or of their development, there's intentional reshuffling of the DNA that codes for this part and this part. And that's what leads to all of the diversity in the variable portions on these membrane-bound immunoglobulins. And we're about to find out why there's that diversity. So there's tons of stuff that can infect your body. You know, there's you know all sorts of viruses are, are 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 mutating and evolving, and so are bacteria. You don't know what's going to enter your body. So what what the what the immune system has done through B cells, and we'll also see it through T cells, it says, hey, let me just make a bunch of combinations of these things that can essentially bind to whatever I get to. So let's say that there's just some new virus. Let's say there's just some new virus that shows up. Right? The world has never seen this virus before. And you know, this B cell, it'll bump into this virus, and this virus won't attach. And then another B cell will bump into this virus, and it won't attach. And maybe uh, uh, several thousands of B cells will bump into this virus, and it won't attach. But since I have so many B cells having so many different combinations of these variable portions on these receptors, eventually one of these B cells is going to bond. Maybe it's this one. Maybe it's this one, and he's going to bond. He's going to bond to part of the surface of this virus. It could also be to part of a surface of a new bacteria, or part of a surface for some foreign protein. And the part of the surface that it binds on the bacteria, so maybe it binds on you know that part of that bacteria. This is called an epitope. Epitope. So once this guy binds to some foreign pathogen. And remember, the other B cells won't. Only the particular one that had the particular combination, one of the 10 to 10th. And actually, there aren't 10 to 10th combinations. During their development, they weed out all of the combinations that would bind to things that are inside of your, that, that are essentially you, that shouldn't be, that there shouldn't be immune response to. So we could say self, self-responding combinations weeded out. So there actually aren't 10 to the 10th, 10 billion combinations of these, something smaller than that. You have to take out all the combinations that would have bound to your own cells. But there's still a, a super huge number of combinations that are very likely to bond at least to some part of some pathogen, of some virus or some bacteria. And as soon as one of these B cells binds, it says, hey guys, I'm the lucky guy who happens to fit exactly this brand new pathogen. He becomes activated. He becomes activated after binding to the new pathogen. And I'm going to go into more detail in the future. Uh, in order to, uh, to really become activated, uh, you normally need help from helper T cells, but I don't want to confuse you in this video. So in this case, I'm going to, I'm going to assume that activation can only occur, or that it just needs to respond, it just needs to essentially uh, be triggered by binding with the pathogen. But we'll see in most cases, you actually need the helper T cells as well. And we'll discuss why that's important. It's kind of a fail safe mechanism for your immune system. But once this guy gets activated, so this is the activated guy, he's going to start cloning himself. He's going he's to say, look, I'm the guy that can match this, 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 this virus here. And so he's going to start cloning himself. He's going to start dividing and repeating himself. So let me just, so there's going to be multiple versions of this guy. Multiple versions of this guy. And not only are there multiple versions of that guy, so they have the receptor, the membrane, you know, they have 10,000 of these. I'm only drawing one or two on each membrane. So they all start to replicate. 
And they also differentiate. Differentiate means they start taking particular roles. So there's two forms of differentiation. So they can go into, so you know, many, many, many hundreds or thousands of these are going to be produced. And then some are going to become memory cells. Memory cells, which are essentially just cells, uh, B cells that stick around a long time with the perfect receptor on them, with the perfect variable portion of their receptor on them. Let me draw a couple of them right there. So that is a memory cell. So that right there is a memory cell. So some will be memory cells, and they're going to be in higher quantities than they were originally. So if, there's, if this guy invades our bodies 10 years in the future, they're going to have more of these guys around that are more likely to bump into them and start and get activated. And then some of them are going to turn to effector cells. And effector cells are generally cells that actually do something. So effector cells. Effector cells. And what the effector cells do is they turn into they turn into antibody, they turn into these effector B cells, or sometimes they're called plasma cells. They're going to turn into, into antibody factories. Antibody factories. And the antibodies they're going to produce are exactly this, this combination that they that was that they originally had being membrane bound. So they're just going to start producing these antibodies that we talk about with the exact so then they're going to start spitting them out. They're going to start spitting out these antibodies. They're going to start spitting out tons and tons of these proteins that are uniquely able to bind to the new to the new pathogen, this new thing in question. They're going to they're uniquely able to bind. So uh, 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 an activated effector cell will actually produce 2,000 antibodies a second. So you can imagine if you have a lot of these, you're going to have all of a sudden a lot of antibodies floating around in your body and going into the body tissues. And the value of that, and why this is a humoral system, is all of a sudden you have all of these viruses that are infecting your system. You have all of these viruses that are infecting your system. But now you're producing all of these antibodies. The effector cells are these uh, factories. And so these, these specific antibodies will start bonding. So let me draw it like this. These specific antibodies, let me, uh, the specific antibodies will start bonding to these viruses. And that has a couple of values. I'll just draw them like that. I don't want to spend too much time drawing them. But that has a couple of values to it. One is it essentially tags them for pickup. Now phagocytosis, this is called opsonization. When you have, let me write this down, opsonization, opsonization. When you tag molecules for pickup and you make them easier for phagocytes to eat them up, this is what this is just called opsonization. These molecules are called opsin, opsonins. But it's, it's as if antibodies are attaching them, says, hey, phagocytes, this is going to make it easier. You should pick up these guys in particular. It also might make these viruses hard to function. Now you have this big thing hanging off the side of it. It might be harder for them to infiltrate cells. And then the other thing is, is that you have on each of these, on each of these antibodies, you have two identical heavy chains, I'll draw it like that, and then two identical light chains. Two identical light chains. And then they, they have a very specific variable portion on each one. And each of these branches can bond to the epitope, to the epitope on a virus. So you can imagine what happens if this guy bonds to one epitope and this guy bonds to another virus. Then all of a sudden, these viruses are kind of glued together, and that's even more efficient. They're not going to be able to do what they normally do. They're not going to be able to uh, enter cell membranes. And they're perfectly tagged. They've been opsonized so that phagocytes can come and eat them up. So we'll talk more about B cells in the future. But I just find it fascinating that there are that many combinations. And they have enough combinations to really recognize almost anything that can be uh, exist in the fluids of our body. But we haven't solved all of the problems yet. We haven't solved the problem of what happens when things actually infiltrate cells, or we have cancer cells that uh, we, how do we how do we kill cells that have have clearly gone astray?